oops. All right, here we go. Ethanol is um, converted into acetaldehyde in the cytoplasm of the cell. The, al the um, enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase um, aids in the conversion. So that's the enzyme that takes it from ethanol to acetaldehyde. So during this conversion, NAD plus is moved to NADH. Then acetaldehyde goes into the mitochondria and is further converted to um, acetate by acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So acetate, this process also converts an NAD to an NADH. And then acetate can go, um, can transfer into acetyl-CoA, which can go into the Krebs cycle. So if you think about it, you're using up a lot of NAD from the con complete conversion of ethanol to acetate. Um, so there, it's kind of a two-step process. In the cytoplasm, you go from ethanol to acetaldehyde. That goes into the mitochondria. And then you do acetaldehyde to acetate. Both of those take an NAD+, and they get converted into NADH. You're supposed to have a equal amount of NAD+, and NADH. However, if you're using these... Uh, the NAD pluses and creating NADH, you're going to have a lot more NADH than NAD plus in your body. And that can cause a few things. It can cause pyruvate to be changed to lactic acid. And the lactic acid can cause a lactic acidosis. And the pyruvate is a process in glyco or uh, gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. So this way is gluconeogenesis, and then this way is glycolysis. Pyruvate, glucose. So the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate is glycolysis. And the reverse reaction from a pyruvate to a glucose is gluconeogenesis. If you do not have um, adequate NAD+, plus, when you come this way, breaking down a glucose, it's going to go um, from pyruvate to lactic acid, which will cause a lactic acidosis. And when you're coming this way, a pyruvate to a glucose, you have a step here oxaloacetate. So you have to go from a pyruvate to an oxaloacetate back to a glucose and you have to have NAD plus to convert that. So if you don't have that, these oxaloacetates are going to be converted to malate and that prevents gluconeogenesis and if you're preventing gluconeogenesis, you're going to have a decrease in glucose and that is why Alcoholics have a resting hypoglycemia. Glycerol 3 phosphate is used in glycolysis. It's converted to glycerol 3 phosphate, which combines with fatty acids to form triglycerides. That uh, means that alcoholics will have a higher trigl triglyceride level and they will deposit those triglycerides into the liver, and that is called hepostatitis. I don't know if I said that right. So a decrease in the citric acid cycle production of NADH will lead to the utilization of acetyl-CoA for um, ketogenesis. So in order for um, the Krebs cycle to work or the citric, citric acid cycle to work, you need oxaloacetate and NAD. If you do not have one of those, I think I wrote this down somewhere, then your body will use 
um, the ketones and the um, to go into ketogenesis. I'm trying to find that paper. So it'll use acetyl CoA, which can be you can use, you can get acetyl CoA from fatty acids as well. So fatty acids you'll do to a fatty acid acetyl CoA. And then that'll, so fatty acids go all the way to an acetyl-CoA. And from there, acetyl-CoA will either move to ketone bodies and go through ketogenesis, or it'll go through the Krebs cycle. And this is how the ketones are made. So acetyl-CoA, you'll need two acetyl-CoAs. And then it gets converted into acetyl-acetyl-CoA so big pick, don't worry about this because he didn't talk about that. But you can use the acetyl-CoA that you're creating uh, and make acetoacetate. And then the acetoacetate, acetoacetate gets broken down into acetone and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And anything that's highlighted here are ketones. So if you break down an acetyl-CoA to acetoacetate, that's a ketone. Um, now it's talking about starvation. So in starvation, um, oxaloacetate is depleted because you're not having enough glucose stores in your body. So you're going through gluconeogenesis to create glucose from pyruvate. And like we said earlier, you go from pyruvate to oxaloacetate and then to glucose. So you're using a lot of the oxaloacetates to create glucose. And starvation, eventually you're gonna use up all of the oxaloacetate and then the Krebs cycle can't work because you need oxaloacetate um, to, to function that. You need an acetyl-CoA and an oxaloacetate to begin the Krebs cycle. Uh, okay, so that goes back to this other paper here. So remember, ketone body synthesis Ketone bodies are used for energy sources. It increases the amount of acetyl-CoA because if you're taking fatty acids, you're getting an acetyl-CoA, so you're gonna increase the amount of acetyl-CoA. Um, it's used with beta, oxida beta oxidation. So fa fatty acid to acetyl-CoA uses beta oxidation. That's the beta oxidation cycle. It occurs in the liver hepatocytes. Um, so the, the acetyl-CoA from the fatty acid, remember, can either be used this one of two ways. Acetyl-CoA will get trans, um, acetyl-CoA will get converted into acetoacetate, which is the first ketone used, and acetoacetate can either spontaneously get degrade to acetone and then we exhale it out, or the acetoacetate can go through um, the beta hydroxybutyrase and um, be used to convert to a beta hydroxybutyrate, and that is also a ketone. Okay, so when you make an acetyl CoA, lots of acetyl CoA it'll get used to acetoacetate and go down one of two pathways. That is ketogenesis. Starvation basically is the same and it the same thing happens in ketogenesis. You're going through ketogenesis and starvation because you're lacking glucose. You're, you're depriving your body of glucose. So you're going through gluconeogenesis and using up all of the oxaloacetate. And then you can't go through the Krebs cycle. So you go through this process instead by using the acetyl-CoA that you would have used in the Krebs cycle. You're going to find some way to use it and you're going to go through ketogenesis. 
and these ketone bodies are acidic, okay? And that can cause acidosis. Um, same thing can happen in alcoholics too. Um, you need NAD plus to fuel the uh, Krebs cycle. And if you don't have the NAD plus because you're using it to move from alcohol to um, if you're using it to go to acetylaldehyde um, and down to acetate and creating and using up all the NAD plus there, then you can't use the Krebs cycle. So you have to use ketogenesis to, to get energy. Cellular death. Necrosis is the spectrum of cell changes that occur as a cell dies. It is commonly used to describe cell death. Uh, so it's characterized by a rapid loss of plasma membrane, organi organelle swelling, mitochondrial dysfunction. There are various types of necrosis, but he said we do not need to know it. So apoptosis is a programmed cell death, and that's normal than necrosis because apoptosis is physiologically normal. It's our body's way to protect itself from injury. So severe cell injury triggers apoptosis, so it doesn't... Um, so our cells can just kind of commit suicide and prevent injury from surrounding cells. The, so that's one way is severe in, cell injury, um, an accumulation of misfolded proteins. So if your um, proteins aren't folding properly, that cell isn't working properly and it will go through apoptosis because it's not functioning as it should. Uh, infections, obstructions and tissues. Autophagy is where your cell is a self-destructive mechanism and it auto digests the cell and that can have both a catabolic and an anabolic side to it. The catabolic process involves the breaking down of the components of the cell and the cell organelles. The anabolic process involves um, the preservation of significant metabolites that are used to maintain um, nutrition homeostasis. Uh, when cells lack nutrition, autography is triggered, so it can kind of eat itself to prevent, to make energy. Um, autoph autophagy provides ATP for cell survival, so it'll kind of eat itself to create energy. Aging is a normal physiologic process that results from a progressive loss of tissues, senescence, is the complete and permanent cessation of cellular prolif proliferation. So that will meet sen senescent cells accumulate over time and cause organ dysfunction. So senescence means that cell will not regenerate and will not duplicate. So the removal of those cells in mice have shown to lengthen their lifespan. That is because if you take away, like if you remove senescent cells, so say I have some senescent heart cells, and that means part of my heart cells are no longer duplicating, I'm gonna have heart problems. But if I take away the senescent cells and remove those senescent cells, my heart's gonna be healthier and not have those problems that would have happened. Um, cellular aging revol results in telomere erosion, DNA damage, epi epigenetic stress, accumulation of reactive oxygen species, and endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticular stress. Um, as we age, our bodies produce and release more cytokines and, and pro-inflammatory substances. So the chronic infl inflammation sets the, state, sets the stage for disease processes. Interleukin-6, interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, alpha and C-reactive proteins are all elevated as we age. 
large amounts of visceral tissue and high fat diets are associated with a high CRP. CRP is C-reactive protein, which me measures inflammation and interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 also measures inflammation. Aging activates the coagulation cascade and the body becomes hypercoagulable, so you're at increased risk for clots. Um, so extracellular changes as we age, there's increased free radical damage because we have more reactive oxygen species, um, arthrosclerosis because you have more free oxygen species or um, more free radicals that are damaging the membranes, um, extracellular matrix is affected by decreased synthesis and increased degradation of collagen. So if you have uh, a dec an increase of the breakdown of collagen, degradation, breakdown of college, collagen, that's how you get wrinkles. Body changes occur include thymus atrophy, like we said earlier, um, in childhood, like as you get older, your thymus gland decreases, which is a normal physiologic process. Uh, losses of eggs in women, spermogenesis, uh, um, losing sperm count in men, um, gastric emptying decreases with age, your muscles atrophy, sarcopenia results from aging. Your height decreases. Frailty is a condition of vulnerability and debility, which occurs after you have a health stressor. So say somebody has a heart attack, you're um, right after your heart attack for a certain amount of time, you're at an increased risk of falls, delirium, disability. Um, so any minor stress right after you have a, 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 big, a big event can have big consequences to your health. Um, I went over ketogenesis and starvation. I'll just touch ketogenesis again because I've heard there's quite a few questions in the test about ketogenesis. So ketogenesis is the formation of ketone bodies, these ketone bodies, and occurs in the mitochondria of the hepatocytes. And like I said over here, over here as well, the um, ethanol alcohol is converted to acetaldehyde in the cytoplasm, but in the mitochondria, acetaldehyde is moved to acetate. And then acetate is converted into acetyl-CoA. So, that part takes part in the, or that place takes place in the mitochondria, and then the acetyl CoA, also in the mitochondria, produces these ketone bodies. It is triggered. Uh, ketogenesis occurs as a la as a result of the unavailability of glucose. This process is triggered by the lack of glucose. So it could be you could go to ketogenesis from starvation or because you cannot get glucose into the cells. So you might have adequate glucose, but you're diabetic. So you, the insulin can't get the glucose into the cell to get broken down. So that's what happens with diabetics. The end of the beta oxidation cycle results in the formation of acetyl-CoA. So beta oxidation, fatty acids. So fatty acids uses the beta oxidation cycle to get converted into acetyl-CoA. In states um, of starvation or uncontrolled diabetes, you don't get enough glucose to produce energy. This means that you're gonna go through this process a lot more, fatty acid to acetyl-CoA, fatty acid to acetyl-CoA, because you're not getting glucose, so you gotta get energy somehow, so you're gonna use um, the breakdown of fat to get energy. Um, and then acetyl-CoA returns to the citric acid cycle to combine with oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is used in gluconeogenesis. So you have to have both 
So, but if you're using up all of your oxaloacetate to make glucose from gluconeogenesis, you're not going to have any oxaloacetate left to combine with acetyl-CoA to go through the Krebs cycle. So your acetyl-CoA is going to go through ketogenesis. Um, it's processed by hepatocytes, and then you get three ketone bodies. You get acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. That is ketogenesis. And the same thing happens with starvation. Um, you start to use free fatty acids. Um, you eventually use up your oxaloacetate from gluconeogenesis. And after starvation, um, for three days, you're breaking down fats to use energy for the brain. Um, and then after you run out of fatty acid or fat from your fat stores and your adipose tissue, then you're going to start breaking down protein um, inside of your cells to, for energy. And that will um, result in organ death and um, cell death and organ failure. All right. I think that was... Most of it for now. Oh, no, cancer. Okay, cancer. Uh, cancer is when cells divide uncontrollably um, through a couple of different mechanisms. So normal cell biology, they're very well differentiated. Each cell knows what it's supposed to do. It has a very specific function. Cancer cells do not have that. They don't arise from stem cells. And they don't, they're not well differentiated, so they could be wherever because they don't say, hey, I'm a brain cell or hey, I'm a liver cell. That's not well differentiated. Um, benign tumors are not cancerous. They have a nice capsule around them. Uh, they do not metastasize. They ha have the suffix oma. So lipoma is a fatty tumor that is benign. And a leomyoma is a benign tumor of the smooth muscle because it has that um, suffix oma. It does not have a prefix except for the origin, okay? So you can get um, symptoms from a benign tumor if they get really large and compress on the normal tissues around it. Malignant tumors are rapid growing and they are not well differentiated. They don't look like the tissue of origin, so say you have uterine cancer. The uterine cancer cells don't look like uterine cells. They might look like lung cells, I don't know, but they don't differentiate well. They don't look like they belong there. They metastasize because they are not encapsulated. They don't have a protective barrier around them, and they don't have something keeping them in, so they go wherever they want. Um, and the lack of the loss of differenti differentiation is called anaplasia. They are also called pleomorphic. Pleomorphic. Morphic is size and shape. So they have variable size and shape. Malignant tumors are named after the cell origin. And so they still have the oma on them like you do in a benign tumor. Um, but they have the root words, they have carcino or sarco on them. So, for example, carcinoma, it, the carcino part tells you that it's malignant. And um, carcino, the prefix carcino, means that it's a malignant tumor on the epithelial tissue. And as we talked about earlier, the um, dysplasia carcinoma in situ, that's on the basement membrane. So it's on epithelial tissue. And that's where the carcino comes from. Carcinoma in situ. Carcino meaning epithelial, okay? Malignant carcino. Adeno refers to glandular epithelial tissue. 
so deep tissue in glands. So if you have adenoma, it tells you that it's malignant because of the adeno part of it. And then it'll, there'll be a root word. So um, adenocarcinoma, adenocarcino, which means um, malignant tumor of glandular tissue. And then just an adenoma would be a benign tumor. So if you get carcino added with adeno, anytime you see carcino, it is malignant. Uh, malignant tumors of connected tissue have the root word sarcoma. So osteosarcoma. You see bone, and you can just think bone is um, a connective tissue. Um, osteo meaning bone, sarco, sarcoma meaning uh, malignancy of connective tissue. So osteosarcoma. Osteoma does not have sarcoma in it, so it is benign. Malignant tumors are muscles. Uh, malignant tumors of muscles um, combine sarco and myo because you could think, oh, it still needs sarco because it muscles are still connective tissue. So myosarcoma. So uterine leo myosarcoma is a malignancy of the smooth muscle of the uterus because it's uterine and then leo myosarcoma. Uh, malignant tumors of uh, nervous tissues have blastoma. So a neuroblastoma is a malignancy of the nerve cell, but a neuroma, there's no blastoma in that name neuroma, that's benign. Um, there's exceptions. So like, you know, lymphoma is the malignancy of the lymphatic system. Leukemia is cancers of the white blood cells. Um, so cancer genetics, proto-oncogenes produce proteins which regulate proliferation. So proto-oncogenes starts with a P. It regulates proliferation. Cancer cells contain oncogenes which are proto-oncogenes that have mutated. Oncogenes function independent of normal regulator cellular mechanisms. So oncogenes um, just proliferate. Uh, they just proliferate uncontrollably because of the oncogenes. Oncogenes also provide cancer cells with the ability uh, the ability to produce their own growth factors. That's known as autocrine stimulation, auto, self, self-regulation. In breast cancer, the oncogene HER2 is responsive to low levels of uh, epidermal growth factor, and that's what stimulates the um, breast cancer. This receptor is the target of some drugs. So if you target the HER2 receptor uh, and you inhibit that growth factor from secreting, it will prevent the cancer from growing. Um, point mutations, translocations, gene amplification, those are some genetic things that can activate oncogenes. So oncogenes are bad. The inactivation of the tumor suppressor gene contributes to unregulated un growth. So tumor suppressor genes are a good thing. So if you suppress the tumor suppressor genes, if you stop what is stopping the cell from growing, that is bad. There are two tumor suppressor genes in each cell and you have to turn them both off by the cancer. So tumor suppressor genes are known as the anti-oncogenes. So the oncogenes have to turn off both tumor suppressor genes in order to be successful in their mission of um, proliferating cancer. The P53 tumor suppressor gene produces the P53 protein and is responsible for monitoring cell stress and activating the caretaker genes. 
So the P53 protein is a good thing because um, it monitors, it's like a security guard. So the P53 protein monitors the cell stress and it activates caretaker genes. So the genes are, are main, maintain the integrity of the genome. They produce protein, the caretaker genes produce proteins that damage or mutate DNA. So think about your cell as, think about it as uh, like a EMT situation. So the P53 protein monitors cell stress and activates the caretaker genes. So the P53 is, a person that finds somebody at the park down. So say I'm at the park and I see a woman down. So I'm the P53 protein, I'm monitoring the park for stress or lifeguard, say that. So, so say the P53 is a lifeguard at a pool and the P53 protein finds somebody at the bottom of the pool. Well, that P53 protein is going to activate a response. So they're going to call for help. That help is the caretaker genes. The caretaker genes are um, going to repair damaged and mutated DNA. So they fix what's wrong. They try to fix the problem. So the help that the lifeguard called is going to come help and fix the problem, like do CPR or whatever, fix the, the person at the bottom of the pool. The P53 protein also controls the initiation of cellular senescence, apoptosis, and suppresses cell division until DNA is repaired. So it, if you use the pool analogy, they, the lifeguard, the P53 protein, will can suppress cell division, so it can say, everybody stop, um, it can, everybody get out of the pool right now, no more people in the pool, um, and everybody out. So it stops action until the DNA, the person at the bottom of the pool is repaired. The loss of function in the tumor suppressor gene and the caretaker gene increases genetic mutations of cancer. So if you don't have the lifeguard, you don't have the help, you don't have the caretaker, you're going to have some problems. Um, tumor suppressor genes may mutate and be passed on to sperm and egg and thus contributing to transmission of cancer causing genes like the BRCA gene. The BRCA gene is an increased risk of ovarian, breast, and prostate cancer. Telomeres are protect protected end caps on each chromosome, and they are maintained by telomerase. The enzyme is normally active in only the germ cells, so only the ovaries and the testes and stem cells. They're not active in any other cells, so normally what happens is you have these end caps at the end of your chromosomes, and each time you go through mitosis, those, those uh, end caps shorten just a little bit. And when they get too short, they say, hey, I'm not strong enough to keep dividing. I'm going to stop dividing, and, um, and I'm going to die. I've made enough children. I can die. Um, when cancer cells re reach that certain point where their uh, telomeres are really small, they activate their own telomerase, which restores them. So they, they don't die. They just keep, they keep regenerating. Um, metastasis. So metastasis of cancer, the epithelial um, mesenchymal transmission is the process by which cancer cells can metastasize. So it has to differentiate itself first. Um, so it has to differentiate, differentiate itself from the tissue of origin. So if it's a uterine cancer, it has to di differentiate itself from uterine cells. And then that will allow it to break away from the tissue. Until that happens, it can only be in the uterus. Interlumen 8 is a potent stimulus for cancer, cancer cells to undergo EMT. So that process. Interleuc interleukin-8 can help that process happen. So interleukin-8 is not good. 
local spread of a malignant tumor is required before distant metastasis can occur. This typically occurs by direct tumor extension. So just kind of common, like think about it commonly. So the cancer cells have to be able to invade local blood supplies and lymphatic cells before it can go somewhere else. Um, the way that it invades local and blood and lymphatic vessels is neoangiogenesis and lymphoangiogenesis. Neovascularization of cancer cells provide them with direct access to the venous and the lymphatic channels. So that gives them um, like its own VIP road to the vascular system and then the lymphatic channels, which is it gives it its own driveway to the highway to your, the rest of your body. Cancers typically spread to the lymph nodes first and then to distant organs. Now, just because the cancer travels to a different organ in your body doesn't mean that it can thrive there. The environment that it metastasized to has to foster its, its um, survival. So if it can't live well there, if it doesn't prosper well there, it doesn't mean that it's going to be, it, it might not be a good site um, of proliferation for that cancer. So it might metastasize there, but it might not really grow there. Sites of metastasis. Um, this is how I remembered it. So you've got three, three spots that will go to bone. Prostate, breast, head and neck. So you got prostate, breast, head and neck, and those go to your bone, okay? Um, they go to other places, but this is how I'm memorizing this. Prostate, breast, head and neck. Those are the three that will metastasize to your bone. Everything else on this list goes to your liver. At some point or another, will go to your liver with exception to a sarcoma. Anything else will go to the liver. So if on the test, if you see a metastasite and liver is an option for one of the answers, unless it's a sarcoma, that's the answer because everything goes to the liver. Um, but colorectal is liver and lungs, like I said, goes to the liver. Testicular, which I remembered because it's one step farther down from the colon. It's one more um, metastasis site. And this might be like crude humor, but um, I always say like a man's brain is in their pants. So testicular, liver, lungs, brain. So it's one step farther from the colorectal. Colorectal goes to liver and lungs. Testicular is a man. His brain is in his pants so liver lungs brain and then like i said the prostate breast and then the head and neck they all go to the bone and then prostate will also go to the liver because everything goes to the liver breast will go to lung liver brain and bone and then the head and neck cancers will go to your lymphatics liver and bone uh, head and neck, you can remember lymphatics because when back in nursing school and whenever you you test check lymph nodes, I always think of the lymph nodes that you're checking as right underneath your jaw there. So that's head and neck. So it'll go to your lymphatics, liver, and bone. Ovarian, peritoneal surfaces, so the inside of um, your peritoneal cavity. That's your ovaries are there, so that makes sense. Diaphragm that's in your peritoneal cavity, that makes sense. And then liver. Um, melanoma, lymphatics, lung, liver, brain, GI tract. Um, so that's how I remember that. So main takeaway, if you see lung, or if you see liver as an option of a point of metastasis, unless it's a sarcoma, that is the answer. Perineoplastic syndromes are a cons um, constellation of symptoms that are ignited by a cancer. They are typically tri triggered by the release of substances from a tumor. Carcinoid tumors can release serotonin into the circulation. Serotonin causes flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, rapid heartbeat. That is known as carcinoid syndrome. 
Um, it says to read and study the chart in the textbook. That is a very confusing and um, expansive chart. I'm not going to memorize it. Um, I'm going to memorize the one that he listed here, which is carcinoid syndrome, which is the release of serotonin, causing flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, and a rapid heartbeat. These types of tumors, the carcinoid tumors, are found in the lungs and the GI tract. Um, it's important to know and understand because that might be the earliest sign of cancer. Cachexia is an imbalance between the amount of energy intake versus the amount of energy used. And you can remember that with cancer because your body is so using a lot of metabolism by proliferating cancer cells. So you're using a lot of energy to make all the new cancer cells. So your metabolism is increased and you, the energy intake that your body is intaking probably doesn't equal the amount of energy your body is producing by replicating the cancer. Um, cachexia is a catabolic process and results in a wasting syndrome. So your body's got to get energy from somewhere, so it's going to eat itself. They experience a loss of appetite, cardiac atrophy, um, dysfunction, gut barrier dysfunction, and release of pro-inflammatory mediators. Um, release of fatty acids, reduced albumin synthesis, weight loss, muscle wasting, they have an increase in apoptosis, and they have an impaired ability to regenerate cells. Cancer staging, you, uh, it's the tumor node metastasis classification, TNM. So T for um, no, tumor size, N for the degree of lymph nodes that they have involved, and M for the distant metastasis. The higher the number, the worse the cancer. Tumor markers are... Um, Markers that are produced by cancer cells and that's found on the tumor plasma membrane or in the blood or in the urine. They're used to help diagnose, detect, and manage some cancers. Um, so if you measure beta HCG, that's elevated in germ cell cancers or cor um, coracocarcinomas. Carcinoembryogenic antigen is elevated in GI, pancreatic, and breast cancers. Um, Prostate-specific antigen is out elevated only in prostate cancers. So the tumor markers are not good screening tools, and they shouldn't be used for cancer screening, but you can use it to see if your body is responding well to cancer treatment. Um... But on the um, on the outline here, I don't even see tumor markers on here, so I don't I don't think um, he really I don't think that'll be on the test. Okay, I think that's it for module one.